Lecture 19, Alexander the Great in History. In the generation in which the founders of our country were educated, and in the next generation in which the uh, proponents of the French Revolution were educated, there were three foundations to a university education. Whether it was at the College of William and Mary, where Jefferson studied, at the College of New Jersey, where Madison studied, what we call Princeton now, Columbia or King's College, where Alexander Hamilton studied, and at the universities in France, at the University of Paris, at the Sorbonne. Those three foundations were, one, the Iliad, two, Livy and Virgil and the founding of Rome, and three, the Bible. All three were taught as being true. The Aeneid was a true story. The story of Horatius at the bridge was a true story. The Iliad was a true story. And the Bible was absolutely true. But in the early 19th century, all three been, began to be deconstructed, criticized, dissected. The Iliad was dissected until it was turned into nothing more than a hodgepodge of stories put together and stitched together by various authors in the 6th century BC. And there was no such thing as Troy. The stories of Livy were fabulous, false. And so too the Bible began to be deconstructed. All of this was done in the name of higher criticism. But I think also political uh, agendas played a role in this. The stories of the revolution in Rome, the overthrow of a monarchy, the institution of republic, that sounded dangerous to a France that had endured a Napoleon and then replaced him with a weak-willed monarch. And uh, the Iliad, all this emphasis on warfare for an age that was craving peace was somehow disturbing. And the Bible? Well, that was the highest authority of, of all. And that began to be dissected and questioned in its historicity. Well, as we have seen, I'm quite convinced that the Iliad rests upon a solid kernel of historical truth, that Genesis and Exodus rest upon a secure kernel of historical truth, and that we find historical truth in the early stories of Rome. But how does a historical kernel of truth get transformed into a far more elaborate story? How does history turn into myth? How does history turn not only into tales that might be false, but also tales that are intended to convey a higher truth? And to understand that in our next two lectures, I want to take a true hero who did historic events in the full light of history, and yet also in the full light of history, gets transformed into a figure of romance, of mythical, fabulous stories. Fabulous meaning fables, not true. And I want us to study Alexander. How did Alexander earn his title, Alexander the Great? For he is a true hero. Unconquered in 12 years of warfare, leading his army all the way from the Danube River out to Pakistan, to the Indus River and beyond, defeating armies many times the size of his, winning the hearts of people all the way from the Gauls of the Danube out to the Bactrians, the ancestors of the modern Afghanistan people. How did he earn this? He was born, and let's just look at it from a pure historical set of facts. He was born in 356. His father was king of Macedonia, King Philip. Philip himself was probably the greatest Greek statesman up until his time. He took what was a large but powerless kingdom, Macedonia, and transformed it into the superpower of Greece. 
He, Philip did this by diplomacy. He also did it by warfare. And he invented a new form of warfare and a new set of equipment for his soldiers. And they became the most formidable army of their day. Philip was a master at mixing his heavy armed cavalry, which had played a small role in Greek warfare up until that time, with his infantry, which carried 16 foot long spears, in contrast to the eight foot long spears of the traditional Greek warrior, and uh, marched not in an eight man formation, eight man deep, but 16 man deep. And the army of Philip, with his heavy cavalry charging alongside this deep, infantry formation in which with the 16 long sp foot long spears, five spear points could reach out from that line to hit the first line of the enemy. He conquered the Greeks and established himself as generalissimo of a Greek coalition and his goal was to lead that coalition into Persia, liberate the Greek cities along the coast of Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey, which were under Persian rule, and then return and dominate the Greek world. But just as he was preparing to do this, he was assassinated. And at the age of 20, his son Alexander assumed the kingship of Macedonia. Now, Alexander was the son of Philip by Olympias, a princess in her, own, in her own right. His father doted upon the boy, and the boy responded. At the age of 16, while his father was away on campaign, trouble uh, arose along the uh, northern border of Macedonia, and Alexander led a force out, defeated the enemy, the Thracians, and established a city called Alexandropolis. It would be the first of many cities of Alexander that he would establish. The father came home and said, what are you doing? You've established an Alexandropolis. You established Philippopolis, didn't you, Dad? Oh, uh, yes, yes, I did. You know, son, Macedonia is not going to be able to hold you. You have a far greater destiny. And at the age of 18, Alexander, whose father had taught him to be better with the sword, better with the spear, better with the infantry formation, more in hardy and enduring than any other soldier, led the cavalry attack at the decisive moment at the Battle of Chaeronea, where Macedonia put an end to the freedom of the Greek city-states. So this was no untried, callow youth of 20 when Alexander became king. He immediately reestablished Macedonian control, lest the Greeks think that with the death of his father, Macedonia would fall into chaos. He then took one year, in the year 335, to campaign in the north. First of all, in order to defeat the tribes of the north, like the Thracians, like the Illyrians, who would revolt at the first sign of Macedonian weakness, he led his troops all the way to the Danube River, crossed the Danube River, received the tribute from the Gauls, and then led them back, captured the city of Thebes, which had revolted, and destroyed it, lest any Greek city think that while he was off and was campaigning in Persia, they could revolt. He did this to win these battles, but secondly, to gain the trust of his army. And in fact, everything Alexander did was marked by the foremost quality of a great leader, and that is foresight. The ability to see a problem before it becomes a problem, the ability to solve that problem in the short term in such a way that the results are also good in the long term. Problem? How to keep the tribes of Illyria and Thrace from revolting when he undertakes his Persian campaign? How to gain the loyalty of his troops? Result in the long term? Not only is there no revolt while he is gone, never returning in fact to Macedonia, and his troops come to feel that he is more than human, that he is divine. And Alexander's troops will fight and win many a battle that other troops would lose just because of their devotion and belief in Alexander. And in 334, he led his army 
not much more than 40,000 troops across the Hellespont. And he hurled his spear into the soil of Asia and declared, I take all of this as territory won by the spear. Now others had sought to liberate the Greek cities of Asia Minor. Spartan king, for example, Agesilaus, had landed there and attempted to liberate them early in the fourth century. He had failed. It was a daunting task. You could not bring enough troops. You could not supply those troops. The Persians offered very stiff resistance. But within one summer, that summer of 334, Alexander had achieved the goal of his expedition to liberate the Greek cities of Asia Minor. He also displayed his further skills as a statesman by understanding that each political entity has its own set of values. And thus, in these Greek cities of Asia Minor, he installed democracies. He overthrew the tyrants who had been supported by the Persians and established democracies. But his intention was far different than Philip. Philip was, would have been content to go back to Macedonia. Alexander convinced his soldiers that if they went back to Macedonia, they would just have to redo what they had done. The Persians would move right into the cities of Asia Minor once again. So they must make one more great effort and defeat the king of Persia himself. For he had not been at the first battle they had fought on the river Granicus in May. He had not even thought it worthwhile, the king of Persia, Darius III, to, to go himself. He had simply sent his governors and generals. So they must bring the king of Persia to bay and defeat him in battle. But in the meantime, they had a winter to pass. And thus Alexander marched all the way into the interior of Asia Minor, conquering cities and tribes that the Persians had not even been able to conquer. And in a great temple in the city of Gordian, there was the chariot of Gordius with a knot tied around it where the tongue of the chariot met the body of it, an elaborate rope tied all around, many, many knots, and it was the belief that whoever untied that knot would become master of all Asia. Many had tried. Alexander, we are told, simply pulled out his sword and cut it, thus showing his ability to get to the very heart of any problem. You might doubt this. His troops believed it. They believed that Zeus had thundered out his approval of Alexander. And it was one more instance to them that he was more than human. Then he marched down, crossed the Cilician gates, the narrow pass leading from Asia Minor into Syria. It had been heavily garrisoned by the Persian troops. And had Alexander's men had to storm the two fortresses that lay astride this pass, they could have suffered irreparable losses. Instead, when Alexander arrived, the head of the garrison had simply led the troops away, leaving a note, remember me when you conquer Alexander. So again, miraculously, they passed on into Syria. And at the Battle of Isis in November of 333, Alexander's army of some 50,000 men totally routed a Persian army of 600,000. And the king of Persia faced with having to go hand to hand with Alexander himself, fled away. Again, showing the superb strategic sense of the greatest general in history, he didn't go flying off after the Persian king. Instead, he spent nine long months battering the city of Tyre into submission. Tyre in Phoenicia, set out on an island with great walls, 35 feet thick, 35 feet high, garrisoned by a brave and patriotic army. Alexander showed himself the master of siege warfare. Very few generals have been equally good at a pitched battle, like Isis, and at carrying out a siege. And nine months later, the city of Tyre had fallen and its population was sold into slavery. 
For it was also another key to Alexander's greatness that he understood the use of power. Whenever he began a campaign, he stayed the course. He was not worried about collateral damage. If civilians were killed, if civilians were sold into slavery, so be it. But it was better to lose one individual and, ex and exert power and fear than to lose a hundred through weakness. So the city of Tyre fell. Alexander passed then on into Egypt, still not going after King Darius. There his troops rested, and Alexander began to understand a higher destiny. And the hero, the true hero, understands that he or she has a destiny, is a man or woman of destiny meant for one specific purpose. And for Alexander, it was to conquer the world and then bring about world peace and a true brotherhood of the human race under his rule. And there in Egypt, he underwent a conversion. Greeks in general despise the Egyptians. They mummified cats. A Greek would prefer to kick a cat. And they had these strange gods with animal heads. Alexander was already understanding that you judge people not by their creed, not by the color of their skin, but by what is in their heart. And he found in the Egyptians an understanding of a far more profound truth that he indeed was the son of a god, that he was the son of Amun-Ra, the supreme god of the Egyptians, who was equated with Zeus, and that he had been sent by God to be invincible and then to bring about the brotherhood of the human race. And he was to start out there in Egypt by becoming a good and just Pharaoh, the Persians who had governed. Egypt had despised the gods of Egypt to let the temples fall into ruin, not paid the priest. Alexander rebuilt the temples, paid the priest, and then to the amazement of his Macedonian officers and soldiers, was crowned as Pharaoh in the ancient ritual, the gods placing the crown upon his head. And there is no more evocative work of art than in a corner of the museum in Cairo where there is a monumental statue of Alexander as Pharaoh. He also appointed to govern Egypt Egyptians. This began his policy of letting local people govern their own people and let every people keep their own customs, not to attempt to impose Greek values, like democracy, upon the Middle East. But now was time for his appointment with destiny and with Darius. And in the fall of 331, he came to grips with an army of one million men led by Darius, the Battle of Galgamela. His brilliant generalship and his personal courage brought about a decisive victory. The army of Darius was defeated utterly, and the king shamed himself a second time by fleeing. No myth here. Darius himself had been a man of some courage, but when he was faced by going hand-to-hand -hand with Alexander, Alexander bearing upon, down upon him on his huge horse, Darius there in his chariot looked in the eyes of Alexander and saw the truth. Alexander did not care if he died as long as he left behind a great reputation, just like Achilles, from whom Alexander believed he was descended. So the Persian king fled again, and city by city, the great cities of the Persian Empire, Susa, Babylon, and finally Persepolis itself, opened their gates to Alexander. With him was the wife of the Persian king and the mother of the Persian king. And the mother of the Persian king, upon seeing Alexander, upon having him tell her 
how much honor she would receive, how she would be utterly safe in his, in his hands, turned to the other Persians, Persians and said, I wish Alexander were my son. Thus he was already beginning to win the hearts of the Persians as well. He had still not caught Darius. He marched after Darius and finally in July of 330 found Darius dead, having been betrayed and stabbed to death by his own officers, led by an Afghan warlord, Bessus. Alexander's troops were now getting eager to go back to Macedonia. But again, using his tr strategic sense and the skills as an orator, which he had been taught by his old teacher, Aristotle, he persuaded them quite rightly that unless Afghanistan and what we would call today Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, the land of Sogdiana in the ancient world, unless Bactria and Sogdiana were conquered, then Persia would rise up against Alexander. He understood that Iran was the key to ruling the Middle East, but that Afghanistan is the key to dominating Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So for, from 329 to 327, in campaign after campaign, Alexander became the only leader in history to conquer Afghanistan. Battering its cities into submission, capturing hill fort after hill fort, tracking down Bessus, capturing him, and having him crucified in the Persian tradition. In the meantime, he had treated the body of King Darius with all honors, had it buried in the sacred tombs of the Persian kings. And more and more, the Persians were, becoming, were coming to look upon Alexander as their king. Then the final victories in Uzbekistan, capturing the great rock of Sogdiana. It was so high that no army could reach it, only a narrow little roadway led up to it that was strongly fortified. And the warlord, the Afghan warlord of the rock of Sogdiana, laughed down at Alexander and said, unless you can find birdmen, you will never capture this. Well, Alexander had his birdmen, his elite corps. They stepped forward and volunteered, and in the night climbed up that icy mountain. Some of them slipped, fell silently to their deaths, rather than give away the strategy of Alexander, carrying their crossbows on their back reaching a higher peak that could dominate the walls of the hill fort. When the sun arose, Alexander shouted up to, key, to the warlord, Oxiartes, I have found my birdmen. And Oxiartes surrendered and invited Alexander into his fortress to celebrate a feast. As they were feasting, Alexander was sitting with it some of his Persian followers now who could translate for him. And at the end of the feast, these girls were brought out to dance. And the Persians were astounded. We have never seen such a thing before. What do you mean, Alexander asked? These, these are the daughters of the great warlords. They never dance for foreigners. This is the highest honor they can pay you. That night, Alexander talked with his friend, Hephaestion. What would it be like if I were to marry Roxanne, the one, who, one of the ones who was dancing, that beautiful one? Her father is Oxiartes. You don't even have a wife in Macedonia, said Hephaestion. This will cause great disturbance among your soldiers. I don't care. I want her to be my first wife. I will never win this country just by war. I must win the heart of the Afghans. And I will do that by marrying an Afghan girl. 
Our child will be the ruler of this empire I have created. I can conquer the Middle East, but I must become a Middle Easterner. And so he did. And in Afghan fashion, the wedding was celebrated. <laughs> Rang out all through the fortress of Axiartes. And in 327, when Alexander led his men on into India, Axiartes was warlord over Afghanistan, and Roxanne was Alexander's wife and would bear his child. On into India, through the Hindu Kush, ah, his men again had to be persuaded. When are we ever going to go home? Boys, it's just a little bit further. And I'm telling you, there's gold in India. But more than that, we will be going out of history into myth. We will go where not even Dionysus and Heracles went. They will speak about us forever. And so his men followed him one more long march. And at the banks of the river, Hudaspes, he met his most noble opponent, the great warlord, the great Maharaja, Porus, with his elephant corps, with his chariots, with his long bowmen. Alexander had to cross the river wide and deep, the pouring rain, and once again, his strategy completely outfoxed this very capable general, Porus. And Alexander's men took on the elephants themselves. It was Porus's tactics to send his great elephants against the Macedonians, knowing that horses, unless they are specially trained, will not go up against elephants, thus negating Alexander's cavalry. And that Alexander's infantry, Porus assumed, quite reasonably, could not stand up to these great war beasts. I mean, these weren't little dumbos, you know. These were mighty killer elephants with huge towers on their backs and, and men with spears and javelins and arrows to fire down. But Alexander's men were as filled with initiative as he was. And they hurled their javelins up into the scrotum of the elephants. The elephants went mad with pain. And Alexander won this victory. And when it was won, instead of killing Porus, he asked Porus to be his friend. He gave more land to Porus, and for as long as Alexander lived, Porus was his honored and trusted ally. East met west there on the river, Eudaspes. But Alexander's men demanded to turn back. That battle with the elephants had taken something out of them. And so they turned back the river Euphrates, sailed back down the Indus, divided the column into three parts, one to go by sea to navigate and map and lay down provisions by which all the resources of India, including its brave soldiers, could be shipped down the Indus and back up the Tigris and Euphrates to Babylon. And there in Babylon, Alexander intended to make his capital of his world empire. He required 80 of his officers and some 10,000 of his men to marry local women so that a new race might be born, a race that was neither Macedonian nor Middle Eastern, but only subjects of Alexander. And he held a great banquet where he proposed that we believe in the brotherhood of the human race under the fathership of God, with Alexander as a ruler chosen by God. He was planning a campaign against Carthage when suddenly he was struck by a fever. As he realized the fever was fatal, he asked that all of his old soldiers pass by as he lay on the couch. One by one, he took them by the hand. Some of them reached down to kiss him. And there, the question was asked of the great god Marduk, should we leave Alexander here or take him back into the, onto the island in the river where it's cooler. 
And the oracle responded, Leave him here, for that is the better thing. The better thing was what the Greeks believed. It is best to, to die young, best to die before the sorrows of the world pull you down. Only the good die young. And so, still not 33 years of age, Alexander died, having won the hearts of the people of the Middle East and having conquered as no conqueror has ever conquered before or since.